Hi, I'm Beth from the West Dallas Public Library. Welcome to another episode of our Let's Go on Vacation book club, where this week we're traveling to the Grand Canyon. This is episode three of that vacation. Now, before we get started in the Grand Canyon, I want to let you know that I'll once again have the poll up where you can vote for where we're going next week. Our choices next week are where is the Bermuda Triangle or where is the Empire State Building. So either New York City or the Bermuda Triangle. So vote for where you want to go next week. Also, in the comments of this video, I'll have two links where you can see the Grand Canyon. One is a Smithsonian video where you can see the views, and the other is a link to a Google map that will let you walk around and do a 360 view of the Grand Canyon. It's pretty cool. But for now, we will move on in Where is the Grand Canyon? We are on Chapter 3, Cities of Gold. In 1540, a group from Spain led by Francisco Valquez de Coronado was exploring the southwest of North America. They were searching for the seven cities of Cibola, which, according to legend, were filled with treasures. Twenty years earlier, another explorer, Hernando Cortez, had conquered the Aztec people of Mexico. Cortez had sent incredible treasures home to Spain. Coronado believed that the seven cities, with all their riches, lay farther north in what is now Arizona. He wanted to send treasure back to Spain and be famous, like Cortez. Coronado's group found nothing more than a small Native American village where the cities of gold were supposed to be. There was no treasure. Coronado, however, was not ready to give up. He sent out a search party to look farther west for the cities of Cibola. These men had no success. But they did tell Coronado that there was a large and powerful river that might lead to the seven cities. So Coronado sent out yet another search party. It was led by, by Garcia Lopez de Cardenas. This group didn't find the cities of Cibola either. What they did discover, however, was the Grand Canyon. They were the first Europeans to lay eyes on it. When they looked down from the canyon's south rim, the Spaniards thought that the river flowing far below was only six feet wide. How could this be the mighty river that they had been sent to find? In reality, the Colorado averages 300 feet across. Still, Cardenas ordered some of the men to walk down into the canyon and look around. It was tough going. There was no trail down the steep canyon walls, and as they got deeper into the canyon, the men realized the rocks that looked so small from up on the rim were in fact giant boulders. Some were almost 200 feet high. That's as tall as a 20-story building. Finally, the men gave up trying to reach the bottom of the canyon and climbed back up. They, they told Cardenas, Cardenas what they had seen, and he decided to return to Coronado. That was the end of the search for the cities of gold. However, the Spanish continued to rule the area that is now Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Southern California for another 300 years. The arrival of Spanish explorers had a major impact on native peoples in the area of the Grand Canyon. The Spanish brought horses, sheep, and cattle to the Southwest. This forever changed how native tribes lived and where they traveled. It wasn't until 1776 that a Spanish priest named the Canyon's River Colorado, which is Spanish for colored red. When he saw the river for the first time, it was during the spring floods. Red silt had washed down from the desert, making the water look red. The United States acquired the land that includes the Grand Canyon in 1803. It was part of what is called the Louisiana Purchase. President Thomas Jefferson bought a huge area of land 
for less than three cents an acre. Settlers, however, were more interested in the northern regions of the Louisiana Purchase. Animals like beaver and buffalo lived there, and they were valuable for their fur. Not until 1857 did the United States government send a group to explore the Lower Colorado River. It was led by Lieutenant Joseph Christmas Ives. Ives ran his steamship, Explorer, aground many times until he finally wrecked it. He was not at all impressed by what he saw of the Grand Canyon. In a report sent to Washington, D.C., Ives wrote, the region is, of course, altogether valueless. Chapter 4, One-Armed Adventurer. The first group to explore the Grand Canyon from end to end was led by John Wesley Powell in 1869. Powell had been a soldier in the Civil War. He had lost his right arm in battle. Powell's men always referred to him as the Major. Powell was a geologist. He was interested in the study of rocks and the Earth's layers. He was convinced that the Grand Canyon offered a great opportunity to study millions of years of the Earth's history. He kept a detailed journal of everything he saw. He took a group of nine men exploring in four wooden boats. They started on May 26, 1869 on Utah's Green River. They had enough supplies for 10 months. Within the first month, one boat wrecked and half of the supplies were lost. So they were always short on food. One of the men quit and went home. Powell and the others continued in the remaining three boats. Early in the trip, Powell narrowly avoided a fatal fall. On July 8th, Powell and another man named George Bradley decided to measure the height of the cliffs above the river. Even with just one arm, Powell had climbed cliffs many times. So had Bradley. They took no ropes or safety gear with them. Powell and Bradley made steady progress until they were about 600 feet above the river. Suddenly, they began to have more difficulty finding a route to the top. Powell was leading. He edged out onto a narrow ledge and saw a place to hold above his head. With his one arm, Powell stretched and grabbed the rock. However, he quickly realized that he was trapped. If he let go of the rock, there was nothing else for him to hold on to. There was no way to go. There was no way to go up or down. Powell's muscles began to cramp. Bradley had no time to go for help. He had to act quickly to save Powell. Luckily, Bradley found a way to reach a ledge above Powell. He leaned over. Right away, he realized that Powell was too far below him. He couldn't reach down and catch Powell's wrist. Bradley had a sudden, desperate plan. He had climbed the cliff just wearing a shirt, pants, and long underwear. He stripped off his clothes and dangled the long underwear down to Powell. Powell had to let go of the rock and let, grab onto the underwear. He had to do it in an instant, and he would only have one chance. If he missed, he would fall to his death. Luck was on Powell's side. He grabbed hold of the underwear and hung on until George Bradley pulled him up to the ledge he was on. Later, back at camp, Bradley wrote in his diary, Climbed the mountain this morning, found it very hard, a very hard one to ascend, but we succeeded at last. In one place, Major, having but one arm, couldn't get up, so I took off my drawers and they made an excellent substitute for rope, and with that assistance, he got up safe. Powell and his men did not reach the Colorado River until July 17th. One day, Powell and his men discovered a small stream flowing into the Colorado. Powell named it Bright Angel Creek because the water was so clear and bright compared to the muddy brown Colorado. Today, 
The main route from the Grand Canyon Village down to the river is called Bright Angel Trail, and it ends right at this spot. Powell and his men were traveling through uncharted waters. They had no idea where they were going or what lay ahead. It was very dangerous. There were hundreds of wild rapids that could easily turn their boats into toothpicks and drown all the men. No one in Powell's group had any experience running rapids. Their boats were all wrong for the trip. They should have had light, flat-bottomed boats that would ride high in the water and glide over hidden rocks. Their boats, however, were heavy rowboats, called dories. Dories sat deep in the water and were hard to steer. Worst of all, the men rowed facing upstream. That meant they could not see where to steer when the rapids hit. <clears throat> Whenever possible, they portaged around dangerous rapids. Portaging means they carried the boats alongside the canyon. After three months, they came to the most dangerous looking set of rapids yet. The canyon walls were sheer stone, rising hundreds of feet. There was no way to portage. Right then and there, three men decided to leave the expedition. Powell tried to persuade them to stay, but they would not change their minds. So Powell said goodbye and wished them well. The men set off to hike out of the canyon and were never seen again. As luck would have it, Powell and the rest of his men had no difficulty getting through the rapids that day. Powell named the spot Separation Rapids in honor of the men who left him there. The following day, August 29th, 1869, the Powell expedition reached the very western end of the Grand Canyon. Their journey was complete. The 1869 trip was not the only one Powell made to the area. He returned to the canyon several times. In 1871, he brought a photographer with him who took some of the very first pictures of the Grand Canyon. Powell kept a detailed journal of each trip and published the report. The book was called Exploration of the Colorado River of the West and its Tributaries. A tributary is a smaller river that flows into a bigger one. Powell became famous and gave many lectures about his, dis about his adventures. His book brought lots of attention to the Grand Canyon and before long, other Americans began exploring the canyon. Miners came searching for copper, gold, or lead. Prospecting in the Grand Canyon was very difficult. Some of the miners gave up the hunt for metal and found a different way to make money. They started renting tents to tourists from back east. Before long, the tent village was replaced by hotels. In 1901, the Santa Fe Railroad ran a spur line to Grand Canyon Village. Now tourists could travel to the Grand Canyon easily instead of taking a bumpy 11-hour stagecoach ride from Flagstaff, Arizona. The railroad company also built a fancy hotel. It was called El Tovar and is still in business. By 1919, more than 40,000 tourists had visited the Grand Canyon in one year. Okay, that is where we'll stop for today in Where is the Grand Canyon? Again, make sure to vote for where you want to go next week. Either Where is the Bermuda Triangle or Where is the Empire State Building? And there'll be links in the comments of this video for you to see the Grand Canyon and explore it in Google Maps. Until tomorrow night, bye!